If you don't, you can just take your Bible and open the Ezekiel chapter 37. Remember, we're working through the book of Ezekiel. Remember Ezekiel, a prophet. Remember back uh, 600 B.C., 500 B.C., Ezekiel was a priest. And then the people of God had rebelled, had been disobedient, had, been, had many idols, and they were proud. And, and God was warning them, warning them, warning them. How did he do that? He called a man, Ezekiel, who was a priest, made him a prophet. And Ezekiel was prophesying uh, through most of the book of Ezekiel. Up until about chapter 33 or so, he was warning uh, the people of God, Israel, of the coming discipline or judgment of God because of their idols and because of their sin. So it was warning, warning, warning that God's going to bring judgment. God's going to bring a, a, a nation in. Well, well, then this is the mark of a turn. A little bit last week, too, a mark in, in a turn in the book. Here's why. Because finally, uh, God allows the Babylonians to come up from the north and destroy you know, there was this initial work where they took 10,000, but now the second time the Babylonians come in and they destroy the temple and they destroy Jerusalem, okay? So, so uh, which we understand that the city of Jerusalem and what it meant to the Jews, we understand that the temple was literally the place of the presence of God. So that being destroyed was just a horrible, horrible thing for the people of God, for Israel. So now not, not only are many of them in Babylon in prison camps like we talked about and suffering and loss of jobs and homes and cars and trucks and man everything they, 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 they're they without nothing you notice I said trucks I'm looking at Matt okay you got that didn't you okay because he's, he's he's Mr. Truck Driver okay so so so, so they're suffering and then they get word Ezekiel gets word is the one that delivers the message a messenger survivor from Jerusalem and says hey all the city is just the walls down the temple destroyed the Babylonians came in and just made a parking lot out of the whole thing, and they are just heartbroken, okay? Because it was a, a work of God, a, a judgment or discipline, disciplinary action of God. Why? Because he was disciplining them because of their sin. Why? Because he wanted them to turn back to him. Why? Because he loves them. And hence, the application to our lives is that it, not, not all suffering is discipline from God. But some discipline is. Some, some hardship, some heartache, some difficulty is a direct result of God bringing discipline to you and I to get our attention, to, to, to get us to turn back to him. And we're, we're aware of Hebrews, again, was a verse I kept quoting, as many as the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And so you don't want to fail of the grace of God, which is God disciplining you and I and, and us responding in repentance and turning back to God. Okay. So anyway, all that, that was what we had seen up to this point. Now the, the book kind of changes a little bit because, because now that the God has executed the judgment, they are, they are broken and they need a message of hope. So now, from now on, a lot of the messages from Ezekiel are messages of hope to God's people. So, so right off the bat, you parents, I, I saw this subtle thing, you know, the, the, the author didn't mention it, but do you see what God, God is our what? Our uncle? No, God is our father. Thank you. Okay, how many are awake this morning? Raise your hand. Okay, okay. How many of you need a cup of coffee? Raise your hand. Okay, okay. okay so, so here, here's the idea, fathers. What does our heavenly father do? Our father warned, warns us, warns us, warns us, and sooner or later, God has to, as many as the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. You might have to give them a spanking when they're little. Do it decently and in order and so on. And then so you're going to discipline them. Guess what? That ain't going to feel good. They're going to feel bad. So then you're going to want to be that father that gives them that love and hope. And you spend that little bit of time with them after. And you remind them that, that they, they had disobeyed you. And you did it because you love them, and everything's okay now. Everything's okay between you and me, and I love you, and, and, and you spend that time. That's what God's doing. God disciplined his people, but he wanted them to know that he loves them. In fact, everything that he did was that, what, what was that phrase we keep reading in the book of Ezekiel? That ye may know that I am the Lord. And that's a, a phrase. So, so the whole book, if you want to summarize the whole book of Ezekiel, and, and you would, you'd be right on is that God brought judgment. Why? That they might know that he is the Lord. God is bringing a message of, of hope to, to God's people. Why? That you may know that I am the Lord. God is all about having a relationship. God's old, the whole Old Testament, God chose Israel as his people. Why? So that he would have a relationship with them, and he would bless them, and he would be his people, and they, he would be their God, and all that. And then they would be the light to show the whole world 
and reveal God to the whole world. Well, that failed, failed, failed miserably. And finally, we, Jesus comes, and the Jews reject him, and now we're the church. And now we have that mission, that as we are saved, we are supposed to be the light of the world and reflect God to the world. Okay, okay so, so that kind of gives you the big picture. And so, so today, last week, we talked about uh, a type of faith. Good morning, ladies. Welcome. Welcome. Glad that you're here. Last week, we talked about uh, the hope of freedom. And, and, and now the, the Israelites were in Babylon, in bondage, Nazi prison camps, if you want to try to get a picture. So when they heard the message of freedom, oh, man. The application to us is that many times a person can get in the bondage of sin, and it can be horrible. Drug addiction, alcoholic addiction, all those other uh, addicted to pornography, and, you're bo and, and it's destroying your life and relationships, and to have freedom from that is very attractive. Because sooner or later, we've reached the dead end. Sooner or later, we've had enough, but we're powerless to be let go and, and to, to be free from it. But we can through Jesus Christ. Now today, today uh, we're talking about faith, but, but the hope of new life. This is more of a salvation message. The hope of new life. And so we're looking at Ezekiel 37, and, and, it, and many of you may know this prophecy of the dry bones. How many have ever heard of it? Kind of raise your hand. Okay, okay, some of you have not. Well, this is one of the, like the author says, this is one of the most remarkable prophecies of the Old Testament. So if you love God and you love the book, you know, when you're in Sunday school, you might as well learn something. Maybe you're being introduced to Ezekiel 37, which some people refer to it as the most remarkable prophecy of the Old Testament. And if, if I heard that and I didn't know that, I would make a mental note that, tonight, that when I get home after church and I have lunch, maybe stop at Kroll's, get a cheeseburger. Okay, then I get home before I take my nap. Guess what? I'm reading Ezekiel 37 because I want to read what some describe as the most remarkable prophecy of the Old Testament. And I kind of want to throw that out to you, to kind of persuade you to go do that. That'd be good. All right, so let's get into the study. You, you see there on page 55, hope of new life. Uh, the idea is to, for us to be reminded or instructed or for God to develop the idea of what's involved in new life for the believer. What's involved in new life for the believer? Well, it's divided into three parts. If you got the bonus material sheet, you can kind of look at one, two, three, and you're kind of with the framework. The first one is the possibility of new life. The possibility of it, okay? Now, I'm just going to jump ahead. Why do we care? Why do we care? Here's why. How many of you know that most people are lost and going to hell? Raise your hand. Okay, okay. All right. So, basically, uh, you can you can look at all the lost, the harvest field, that's white on the harvest, okay? And and you can look at basically two types and be ready. You got the, you got one type that is, that is proud, trusting in their money, trusting in their religion, trusting in something other than Jesus, okay? And they're, they're proud about it. And they don't feel they need Jesus. Anybody ever talk to anyone like that? <laughs> okay, because I'm a certain, I'm a Packer fan. My great, great grandpappy was a Packer fan and we're gonna die a Packer fan, except plug in their religious system. That's what they say. Okay, or their money, or they're comfortable. You know, go talk to somebody else, like one of the drunks on Broadway. They need Jesus. I don't know what I need Jesus for, okay? You run into that group, your approach is going to be to, to use the law, the Ten Commandments. Brush up on it. Know it. And you're going to, because the Bible says by the law is the knowledge of sin. And in Romans chapter 3, toward the end, it tells you that every mouth may be stopped and that all may become guilty before God. So you have to take a proud person and you have to help, help them understand their need. That they're sinful and sin is an offense to a holy God, and they're going to hell no matter how much their, their paycheck is. Yeah. So you're going to use the law with the proud because they you have to bring them to a brokenness, or the God does, the Holy Spirit does. But if you're a soul winner, if you care about them, you, that's going to be your approach. You're going to use the law, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Law is going to bring conviction that they've broken the commandments of God. You ever told a lie? You ever stolen anything? Doesn't matter. So, so you're going to, but now there's another type. There's a type of person that thinks they're, God could never save them. They've done. You, you don't understand what I've done. You don't know. You don't know all the evil that I've done, and they feel hopeless. They feel like there's no hope for them. And there's a large number of those as well. 
Now that's the state of Israel right now. They feel hopeless. They feel abandoned by God, and they, they were warned, 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 and now they're broken and they're hopeless. Now you run into people like that, where, and you're going to see by their body language. You're going to hear words such as, oh, Adam, you don't understand. And they mean to say, you don't understand how bad I am. You don't understand what I've done. And, 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 and or they'll literally say, oh, there's no hope for me. But you can tell by their words, their spirit, okay, that's the one where you want to bring the love of God. And you want to bring this kind of message, the hope of Jesus Christ. You know, so it's going to be that, that street bum possibly, although I've talked to some street bums, man, they're just as proud as, it's, 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 they're just as proud. It, it doesn't have to do with what level of money. They can have 10 bucks in their pro pocket, and that's 10 more than their other guy. And, and they look down their nose because they got 10 bucks. So, so, but, but you got to read their spirit. So for me to go to somebody who's broken and hopeless and, and put the law on them and convince them that they're a sinner, that is not necessary. I'm beating them down. I'm kicking, I'm kicking a sick dog, man. Don't do that. Well, you got to admit that you're a sinner. Huh. They're just about bleeding already. You know, you see, you see the difference? Nod your head if you see the difference. That's just a general approach that, that the basic Christian can understand. This is a proud sucker, hardened face. I'm going to use the law. Versus someone who's broken, and this could be a child, Joy. Do I get an amen from you, Joy? You run with the kids? Mm -hmm. that, that uh, they can yeah. be broken, and so you can give them that message of hope? Okay, because you're doing it, I'm not. Okay, all right, good. And she says yes. All right, so that's that's kind of an introduction. So the possibility of new life, Ezekiel 37, let's read the verses. It says in verse uh, 1 to 3, and then we jump to 11. Ezekiel 37, verses 1 to 3, the Bible says, The hand of the Lord was upon me. So that's, that's Ezekiel, the hand of the Lord upon Ezekiel. We're there, okay. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. So this would be, make a great movie, right? So Ezekiel <laughs> is in the spirit and off he goes and you, Hollywood could really do this up. And now it's like a vision, kind of like Revelation, you know, and, and he's in a vision. And Good morning, sir. I'm Rick, by the way. Your name is? Scott. Scott. Welcome, Scott. Scott, good friend of mine. Okay. Everyone, everyone make me feel welcome. Okay. I just made you smile. Okay, good. So, so, so Ezekiel is carried out in the spirit, and you know he's literally having an out of the body experience, and he he, he has him over this valley. Whoa, whoa. Okay. All right. I thought he's got. That's pretty interesting already. I don't even know what's going on yet. Okay. But it's God working through the man of God. No different than God working through our pastor and what. God lays on pastor's heart is not is not the word of pastor. It is in fact the word of God. Same thing. Okay, but it's a little cooler. <laughs> okay, so 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 it says, and you see in verse two, it says, and caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, thou knowest. So Ezekiel has this vision, a great valley full of many bones. We're not just talking a couple of bones here. He was struck by the, 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 the number of bones that I would think that if you, it would be like, like maybe a battlefield. And ima imagine, I, I have no, no, no personal experience anywhere close to it in my life, but imagine beholding a valley and seeing all the bones, something really sad, awful has happened. Death, you know, oh, you know, and he's struck by it. And then God asked him the questions, asked him the question, uh, and they're very dry. Did you catch that? What does that mean? That means that they were there for a long time. All right, and then the Lord asked him the question, and he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? And I love I love Ezekiel's humble response. You know, sadly, you, you answer this question. But but I, I think sometimes in my pride, I'd be quick, well, well Lord, I, I'd be quick to suggest. I'd be like, I'd be like Peter, you know, where God said something, Peter said, Well, Lord, go do this. Hey, Peter, why don't you just shut up? And like God, <laughs> God be God, you know. At least he was humble. You know, he, he didn't even he didn't even open his mouth, he didn't even have the suggestion. Well, Lord, here's what I think. How about you just be quiet and admit you don't know what's going on? I love the humility there. And that's really important. 
because God is meek and God is called. We went over this, right? God is referred to as the Lamb of God, Lamb, meek. The Holy Spirit descends as a dove, a sign of peace and meekness. If you want to have, if you want to be spirit filled, you cannot be proud. So don't miss that there. The very fact that God is working with this man, why is that? Well, you can see by his response. He wasn't telling God what's what. Well, Lord, I, you know, I kind of did, I kind of looked at this one pile, I'm doing some math, I'm coming up, but just be <laughs> quiet. Not only was he quiet, which, you know what, even if you got an ounce of pride, how about you just shut up anyway, if you think you have an answer? That would be better. But you see the humility of it. And I, I just had a part there for a second. The humility of this man, no wonder God was working with the man and using the man. Because God himself is meek. That's why God hates pride. He ain't going to call some proud sucker to be a part of anything that God's doing. He was humble. You can tell it by his words. And, and his answer then, he says, uh, and I answered, Lord God, thou knowest. Oh, and you can just think of what's all in there. But humility, I don't have a clue. You know, and if we're humble, we'll admit that when we got saved, you had to come to that point. Not my religion, not my good looks, not my money, not anything I've ever done. We come, we come as a blind beggar. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Your religious attendance matters nothing. All the money you put in a collection plate, all the good deeds. I was a Boy Scout. I helped ladies across the street. God could care less. Why? Because of our sin. And all our righteousnesses are as, are as filthy rags. Amen. And we come to God poor, blind. We don't see. We see nothing except we are sinful. And we need you. I don't want to miss the spirit of what of what's going on there, okay? So so he doesn't know, and he said, uh, Oh, Lord God, thou knowest. So then from verse 3 to verse 10, God tells, <laughs> God starts speaking, and Ezekiel starts speaking, and if you read that, the bones start coming, they, flesh starts to appear on the bones. Okay. All right. So then, so then, which is just, that that's maybe part of, it's re the remarkable nature of this prophecy. So, so the number of the bones, they were many. And I thought of that scripture, and I think I have it in the bones material sheet there. You can look at it later. But remember the reference where broad is the gate? And narrow is the way. Yeah. And how many be that go there and there? Many. 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 What's the reference? One what? That's Matthew 7, 13. Yeah, it's Matthew 7, 13, but it's, one, it's under number one, Pearl? Yeah, number one seat. One C. Where it's uh, very yeah. many. Included. There it is. So you can read this. So the idea, many bones, many, it's a perfect example of our world today. And I thought, how many of you know that many are going? Broad is the way. You understand that? Okay. All right. Because for a new Christian, you might think, like I did when I was saved for a whole week, thought I knew anything, was that I thought everybody's going to heaven. No, they're not. So we're spending five seconds on the re realization that the Bible says that God says, for the most part, many are lost. Many are on the Broadway. Many are going to hell. And, and, the, and those that are going to heaven are few. It's a narrow way. It's Jesus Christ only. So you should know that, and I think many of us do, so I'm not going to park there. But, but that's a truth also. Okay, all right. So, so uh, then, the, then Ezekiel is speaking, and as he's speaking the words of God, literal flesh is coming back on the bones. And before his eyes, He's seeking these, these dead, many, dry, very dry bones come back to life. And hence the miracle. That God can do that. Is that a picture of anybody or anything? What comes to mind? How about us? Thank you very much. That's exactly, exactly what happened to you and me. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were dead. And God made us alive again. Okay, so, so, so you can look at it historically, great, but I love it already that many of you are seeing the spiritual picture that it is of you and me. Okay, God. All right, so then in verse 11, it says, and will be done. Uh, then, said, then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. 
Behold, they say our bones are dry and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. So God interprets the vision that all these bones represent Israel. Okay, And, and, and Israel is saying that we are without hope. That's what we just read. <coughs> Hence the need for, for the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because they're broken. Okay? That happens with discipline. Many of you parents know this, that when you're spanking your children, uh, they'll teach you, like in How to Spank Your Children class, that you really your goal is to break their stubborn will, right? So they're already there for all this. Okay. All right, so, 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 so the possibility of new life, it, it starts with a realization that you need it. It starts with an awareness that you're dead. I think I included verses, for example, under 1E and on the bonus material sheet. It says, and you being dead in your sins. You're walking and talking. You're going to work. But God says you're dead. Guess what that means? You're dead. <laughs> but when you grab a hold of that, that I'm dead or in the macro, your buddies, other people, if they're lost, they're spiritually dead. That's why they live like hell. And that's why they have no hope. Especially this group of people, that their sin is, is made a mess of their life. And they're without hope. God, when you find out such a circumstance or such a person, God is informing you because he wants you to go bring that message of hope, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to that lost, hopeless man or woman or child. Amen. All right, all right, good, good, God. So, so, so the first step, the possibility of new life, okay, yes, yes, okay, but, but we have to realize it, or the person has to realize it, or your child has to realize it, or your grandkid has to realize it, that they're dead without, without hope. Okay, okay, so no, then the next step is, is the process of new life. So we're on page, page 58, or if you want to look in Ezekiel 37, verses 12 to 14, verses 12 to 14, the process of new life. Now, right off the bat, they said that, and I said, oh, I had a problem with that. Here's why. The word process, and I have this in the bonus material, it's under number two now, that when they, when they talk about the process of new life, thank you for nodding, because you know what I'm going to say. We have to understand that going to heaven, getting saved, is not a process. <coughs> thank you very much. Did I get that? Yeah, I knew that. I knew what I had to tell you. All right, you're welcome to my neighborhood, Sarah. Okay, so so it's getting saved is not a process. There might, it, it, there's like, it's like a birth. You ladies tell me, you know, you're pregnant for nine months. So there's a buildup to the event, understood, and there's maybe some degree of pain or struggle involved, okay? Same thing happens spiritually. The, the gospel is planted, the seed of the truth, and for some people, they get saved first, second time. Some people, they hear it, they're overwhelmed by it, they're convicted, they get saved that first encounter or within a couple of days. But for most people, it takes quite a while. Weeks, months, longer. I know that there's so many testimonies in our church where, where these young people, you know, anywhere from 12 to 20, where, where they, they've heard the preaching a long time, but, but then the Spirit of God's convicting them, making it personal, and there's a, there's a struggle that takes place inside. That's why your hands sweat. That's why your face sweats. That, that's why uh, I think it's Obanessa's boy, where it was like he was in a wrestling match, and he didn't... Tell me how you got saved. He described it because he doesn't know all the biblical words, and, and he's going like this, as he's, and I, I just kind of... Let go, you know, like you, like you got pinned, yeah, and you just, yeah, 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 that's what it is, that's what it is, that's what it is. So the process of new life, there may be some buildup to that event, but it's literally an event, like a birth, okay? And, and everybody knows the physical birth, the <coughs> moment you're not here, whoosh, out comes the water and the baby, and you're here, and that's why you have a birthday, because on, the, on a line, a timeline, there's a specific moment in, on that timeline where you got born again. How many of you understand that? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you understand that? Say amen. Amen. All right, all right, good. That's very important to understand because you and I will run into different people that think they were saved when they were three or they think that, you know, that they're, they're on a path where they're being saved. No, nope, no, nope, that's not biblical at all. At all. You're hearing preaching. You're hearing truth. There will be some struggle, but there's a time, there's a moment, uh, there's a, an encounter with God where in your heart you surrender you submit, you give in, you have a response, and you ask God to forgive you. You, ask, you, you. you say a prayer, you say words. It doesn't matter exactly what the words are, but they're words that reflect your heart where there's a surrender to, to the will of God. And you ask God to save a wretched sinner like me, okay? 
So in that sense, it's not a process. It's an event. Now, after you get saved, then it becomes a process. And there's a big word for it. Sanctification. Thank you. Hey, you're going to say it. Okay. Sanctification. This ongoing walk with God and this daily encounter with God where he's constantly revealing, you know, faults and failures and sin. And he's putting, uh, you know, the fruit of the spirit, which he himself is producing in you and I. And we're, and, and there's this initial, initial born again experience where even some people realize, man, there's something different about Rick, you know. But, but then there's this sanctification process that <coughs> that is a process. And that's ongoing. Now, you're already saved, you're already a child of God, but God is always working in the rest of your life. Working in you to conform you to the image of his dear son, to be more like Jesus Christ. And everything that happens is for God's purpose to that end, for you and for me. Yeah, praise the Lord. Amen. That's some of you understand. Amen. Amen. And so if you need a verse for that, I think I have it under... Uh, Philippians, yeah, right, right there under under A, under two A, uh, and then Roman numeral I. It says, "Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, that's your salvation, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ." That's an ongoing performance. So, so gradually you lose confidence in yourself. That's okay. It's replaced by confidence in God. And for me, that's an important verse. As I see my sinfulness, I feel bad about it, and I realize it's not about me. It's about being confident in God. That he which hath begun a good work in you, he saved my soul, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, the second coming of God. God never leaves you, never forsakes you. He's always at work in your life. It's good to understand that. Okay, so that's kind of an introduction. Let's read the verses. All right, verse 12 to 14. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, you can hear the love of God. I, I just can't say it as lovingly as he could. But you can just see the love of God in the word. Thank you. All right. Oh, my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. He's going to bring new life. Verse 13. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O oh my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you. Does that sound familiar? Amen. Being born again. And ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I am the Lord, that, that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. We're going to stop right there. So it's, it's a work of God. It's a work of God. And it's his motive is love, O oh my people. So he pursues them. And he does a work. That's what he did with them. He was the prophecy to Israel was that you're in a bad, bad way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna resurrect you as a nation, and I'm bringing you back to your land, and I'm gonna restore the relationship with you. I'm gonna be your God, and you're gonna be my people again. Can you imagine when they heard that? Can you imagine how the joy they must have had? Amen. Oh man, that's just phenomenal when you think about that for 30 seconds. But, but that, again, the personal application, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. The process is, it's a work of God. And he, he plants the gospel. He gives us the faith. He works in us, and he brings fruit, uh, fruit, meat for repentance. And we're sorry for our sin, and we turn to God. And we ask for forgiveness. And he gives us life. Uh, Jesus said, many of you know that verse, I have come that you might have life, and you might have it more abundantly. And now God has given you, now, now let's think, and maybe nobody here, no. But, but, but think of somebody that is hopeless. How many of you ever had some experience with hopelessness? Raise your hand. It's, it's such a bad set of circumstances. I've been there. And hope is so good. And God gives you that hope. And that's what he was doing there. But I, and when you're hopeless, sometimes you think, you know, there's going to be no hope of changing anything. But God's message is that you can start over. You can wipe the slate clean. Everything can be washed in the blood. Amen. And you can start over with me. I mean, it's just a marvelous, it's marvelous. The blood. Amen. Amen. And if it ever happens and you've experienced that, you end up loving God so much you can cry. And you end up having a, a feeling of love for God. And you are so thankful for something. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. 
If you haven't thought about the blood of Jesus in a while, you need to go check this out. If you've kind of taken the blood of Jesus for granted, it's because you've kind of lost sight of what we're talking about at this moment. But the more that God reveals sin in your life, and the more you, the only, the only course is to come to God and, and agree with God and be sorry and ask for forgiveness. And what's going to wash away that sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And you start doing that regularly, and you know what? The blood of Jesus becomes your best friend. And you're so grateful for the blood. So, so let the Spirit of God reveal whatever he needs to in your life. Okay, but we see what's going on there. So, so we talked about the possibility of new life. It involves a recognition of our need, a recognition of our deadness, a recognition of our sin. And we are separated from God. And that's what death is, right? Death is separation. So you can be spiritually dead. It's separated from who? God, your creator. Okay? Uh, and then physical death, what happens? We're spirit, soul, and body. Death is separation. The spirit and soul depart. And, it, and, and the body lays there. Separation has occurred. But if you die without Jesus Christ, you die separated from God forever. Where is that? In hell. Hell. All right. Good. Got it. All right. So, so, so we understood the possibility of it. We, sent, we understand the process of it, the great love of God, the blood of Jesus, forgiveness of our sins. God re forgives, restores, uh, gives us new life. Okay. And now, lastly, if you want to turn the page, we, uh, the portrait of new life. Again, a portrait. You're looking at it to see, you know, what, what a portrait. So, so the portrait of new life, God or the author, is trying to help us understand what it looks like. What, is, what does new life look like? Let's take a look. It says, uh, we actually have to go back to the prior, prior page because Ezekiel 37, verses 23 to 28. Let's read those, okay? So verse 23, neither. So this is after that relationship has been restored. For you and me, we got saved. We got born again. Here's what it's going to look like. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. Okay, bunch of stuff packed in there. Uh, but basically, <coughs> as we walk in newness of life, we have a sensitivity towards sin. We have a hatred for sin. Uh, there's, the, there's the moving away from sin. That has to be a part of the new birth experience. It was a part of mine where you depart from uh, ungodly people and ungodly ways. God gives you the, abil the, the ability now to overcome because you've been redeemed. You've been let go and free from the sin. So, so it's... It's a, a life that's reflected by a desire for holiness. And that's achieved through obedience to the word of God. And remember, we, we talked in weeks past, their problems were with idol and pride and so on. Notice it says, I will save them out of. I thought of that, uh, that New Testament verse where, where the, I think it's in 1st or 2nd Corinthians, where God says, come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord. So my, my words that I just explained, that, that's the reason why I'm thinking that way. Because when God saves you, God does say, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Amen. And that's what happened in my life. I wasn't hanging around with the gang membership. I wasn't hanging around with the tavern crowd anymore. It was work that God, I realized that this is wrong, this is sin, I'm not going to be a part of it anymore. So, so that, that's an evidence that you got saved. And that's what it's talking about there. And so again, how many of you this happened to some degree in your life? Raise your hand. Okay, so you know, all right, we're going to move through this quickly. But, but again, we're in Sunday school class, so you ought to see it in your own life. It's evidence that you got saved. Great, great, great. But also understand it about your kids and grandkids. So in other words, you mean, Rick, if they come up and said a prayer, but they're continuing to live in the same lifestyle, that they may be unsaved? Correct. All right, so, so uh, and then, no, so, so that's, I will save them out of. All their dwelling places wherein they have cleansed. And then I will cleanse them. We think of that verse in 1 John, right? Uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And uh, what? Cleanse us. So the, clean, the cleansingness. And then notice at the end there, I will be their God. So the rest of the verses, we'll read them and then we'll be done because I know you're getting tired. So we're on page 60 there. It's all about relationship. So it's all about relationship with God. So, so uh, if, if you want to remember anything, this desire to be holy this desire to, to, to live godly and be in obedience. Why? 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 Why are we looking at all this? 
It's because now you have a relationship with God. And God is holy. So, so you see evidence in your life or in others. But why, why, why? What made you do that? Because you have a father who's God. The relationship. All of it is a result of the relationship you have now with God, your maker, and who's now your savior. So let's read. For example, in verse 24. And, and David, my servant, which is a, a reference to Jesus. Because he's of the lineage of David. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. Guess what? When you get saved, you have a king. And when the idea of a king is that there's a kingdom, and there's a king, and there are servants. Guess who the servants are? Okay, that means we're going to do what the king says. Okay, that's, but why? Relationship, okay? And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd. I could go off on that tangent. He's the good shepherd. We're the sheep. Because we're dumb as sheep. Okay, at least I am, not you. All right, so let's go. And, and, and they all shall have one shepherd. They shall all walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. So it's a life of holiness, a life that's reflected by obedience to what Jesus said. All those New Testament verses where Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words or keep my commandments. Okay, but why are you doing that? Because you love God. We love him because he first loved us. It's a, re, it's a result of a relationship. All right, 25. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, which is the case right now. They're over there in Israel. They're over in the land that God prepared for, for Jacob. That's been fulfilled. Uh, that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein uh, your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. That's a reference to Jesus. Verse 26. Moreover, I will make a covenant. Again, a covenant is a key word of a strong relationship between God's people and God himself. You're part of that now. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant, as in everlasting life, as in eternal life. So don't miss it. All right. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. I think that's, uh, that's hints of uh, scripture in the book of Revelation. When it comes back, verse 27, my tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forever. So quick bi biblical overview. Remember God's relationship with Israel? And the purpose was that they were going to make God look good. Okay, they, they, they dropped the ball. Jesus comes. They reject Jesus. God now called the church. You and I, our mission is to make Jesus look good. Some are doing that in Paris. Some are doing that on Irwin Street. Okay, and we're, we're presenting Jesus Christ, presenting gospels that the world may know God. That's what God seeks. That's the will of God, to have a relationship. But the day is coming, the rapture, the church is gone, God's going to take his attention back on Israel. And it, is anyone noticing that there's war over there in Israel? If anyone fed, read, read the book of Revelation and, and Daniel, Jim and I were talking about that, that the false peace is signed, the start of the seven-year tribulation, we're not going to be here. The rapture is going to take place. We're going to be gone before the false peace is signed. Why would you need a false peace? Because there's war going on, hence the idea that it might be very soon. So the message to you and me is, if you got anybody that you love, you know, if there's anybody that you hate, go tell them about Jesus. So God would <laughs> save them, and they would avoid the pending judgment of God. All right, thank you for listening. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, again, we thank you for the word of God. I know I'm talking a mile a minute, but our minds and our spirits can, can take it all in. And Lord, I pray for everyone here that we would go back and read Ezekiel 37 and realize this remarkable prophecy, the most remarkable of the Old Testament, and see it as a picture of what you've done in us. And that we would be moved to, to follow you and to love you. I pray this blessing on all that are here. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.